Our first reading is the account of the ascension of Jesus in the book of Acts. This is the first chapter, verses 6 through 11. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. May God add blessing to the reading and the understanding of this scripture. You're invited to stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. The gospel reading is the account of the ascension of Jesus in the gospel according to Luke. This is the 24th chapter, verses 44 through 53. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Where was the best place? The best place for you to hide when you were growing up and playing hide and go seek. Did you have that one place where you knew very few people could find you? Where was that place that you hid, maybe from your parents or your grandparents, when they wanted you to come in and, and clean your room? When they wanted you to come in for supper? When they wanted you to come in because it was time for you to take a bath before you went to bed and you weren't ready? Where was the best place to hide? Where was that place you went maybe as a teen? A place of solitude, a, a place where you felt safe. A place maybe where you could journal or write in your diary or, or maybe just sit and think and, 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 you, and you knew you weren't likely to be interrupted. And, and maybe in that place, maybe you had dreams and, and maybe you had hopes and, and, and maybe you thought about things you never thought any other time. Maybe it spurred your creativity. Do we still have those places? Do we still need them? We've been wandering and wandering with the disciples and Jesus in this resurrection journey and what we know as Eastertide or the great 50 days that take us from Easter to Pentecost, which we will celebrate next week. And, and we have perhaps watched with the disciples in, in wonder and excitement and, and sort of with a, a sense of uh, of peculiarity at this resurrected, these resurrection appearances of Jesus. He shows up to random disciples on the road to Emmaus. He shows up to the women outside of the tomb. He, he shows up behind a locked door. He, he, he makes these appearances and, and, and it says that sometimes the disciples believe and sometimes they doubt and maybe we do too. And, and then we come to this particular Sunday you might remember a couple of weeks ago where uh, Paul says that he's perplexed but not driven to despair. I, I think the word perplex really sort of describes not only that journey that the disciples had in the resurrection appearances of Jesus, but I, I think perplexity also describes this Sunday we know as Ascension Sunday. M most pastors I know, if not all, are rather perplexed by these stories. 
the Acts of the Apostles and Luke, which were one time one volume. <laughs> And they were separated later to, to lead uh, the, uh, those of us who would read from Jesus' birth up through his ascension and then from his ascension in the Acts of the Apostles to the beginnings of the church. But this one story they have in common. Now it's not the same, but they have this story in common. And, and in Luke's gospel, it says that, that Jesus opens up the, the scriptures to their understanding, that, that Jesus tells them that everything written about him in Moses and the law and the prophets and the Psalms uh, was true. And, and it says that he wants them to stay in Jerusalem and, the, and that power will come upon him. But then he takes them out as far as Bethany and, and he's lifted up out of their sight while he's blessing them. And in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, Jesus tells them that he's a, about to leave them and, and that power is about to come. And they say, oh, is, is this when you will restore the, the right nature to, to Israel? Is this when you will overthrow the Romans and put a Davidic kingdom in place? And he says, it's not yours to know the, the day or the time. And, and then it says, uh, he, he reiterates to them about his life, his death, his resurrection. And he says to them, you are witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. He, he gives them their, their call. And then it says, as they are watching, he is taken up from them into the clouds. And, and the Acts of the Apostles goes on to say that the disciples stand there, gaping into the clouds. Wondering, is he coming back? Is he going to give us more instructions? Where did he go? And it says, two angels appear and say to them, Men of Galilee, why are you, why are you looking up into the clouds? He will come again even as he went. Stop looking up. Get about the business that Jesus told you to do. But we get caught. No more and no less than those disciples looking up into the sky. We get caught because sometimes we don't know what to do next. I know Jesus said for them to wait, that power would come upon them. I know he said that they would be witnesses to his life, death, and resurrection to Judea and Jerusalem and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. But okay, where do you start? And what do you say? And who will believe you? So it's just easier Perhaps not unlike the disciples, it's just easier to wonder where Jesus went and where heaven is. If we could just figure that out, somehow we think life would be better. Now, let's understand, in biblical times, the belief was that the earth was flat. And then, in fact, it was a flat disk. And that somewhere there were pillars towards the edge of the earth that were holding up a dome, which was considered heaven. And beyond that dome was the swirling chaos out of which God created order from the very beginning. And that in fact it was only by the power of God that that dome was able to hold those chaotic waters back. And so that's probably where Jesus went. The interesting thing is that when, when European missionaries got to South Africa... Uh, they, they faced a theological conundrum of sorts... Because you see, the African people believed that, that God, whom they called the biggest one or the opener of the way, which I love, because followers of Jesus, for us, were called followers of the way. <laughs> so the opener of the way is how they knew God. And they believed that God was in the ground. Because out of the ground, life grew. Out of the ground came the stuff that animals ate and that they ate and, and, and that's what kept them alive. So they believed that, that the opener of the way, they believed that, that the biggest one existed in the ground. And so when they needed wisdom, they would go to caves where they had set up lithographs and, and, and lit candles and they would wait for the ancient voice to come to them. So we believe the higher we get, the closer we get to God. <laughs> because rain comes and sun comes from the sky and that waters the earth and that helps life grow. And our South African brothers and sisters initially believed that God came from the ground from which things grew. Isn't it interesting? What is the common thread in those beliefs that God is one who brings life and who brings that which sustains life. 
So maybe not unlike the disciples, the two angels are saying to us in our day, hey, stop looking up. Stop trying to figure out if Jesus went to some place like, you know, Delaware or Hoboken or Austin or (laughs) Sacramento or Budapest or even Vatican City. Stop trying to figure out where Jesus went and what time he's going to come back and start looking at the work that Jesus needs you to do. And that's that's the hard part. Start, Start looking at where Jesus is in your life because here's the interesting thing. It's not like Jesus hasn't disappeared before from their sight. The interesting thing is every time he disappeared in these resurrection appearances, he reappeared, right? So Mary sees him and Jesus says, the resurrection, right on the day of resurrection, and Jesus says, do not hold on to me, for I have to return to my God and your God. And he disappears from her sight. She doesn't know if he's ever going to come back. He does say to her, tell the disciples that I will meet them in Jerusalem. So she runs back and tells them they don't believe her. And then Jesus appears to them. So he disappears and he reappears. Now remember with me in the Gospel of John. The disciples are in a locked room. Jesus passes through that door. The resurrected Jesus passes through that door. Says, peace be with you. The sins you forgive will be forgiven. He says, peace be with you again. And then he disappears. Will he be back? Thomas wasn't there. A week later, Jesus reappears. The disciples on their road to Emmaus. Jesus walks along with them as a resurrected Christ. They don't recognize him. They get to Emmaus. He breaks the bread. Immediately they recognize him. He disappears. They run back to tell the other disciples. And then Jesus appears again to them. And it says they believe, but some doubted. So Jesus says, give me a piece of fish so that he can eat it, so he can show them that he's real. You see, why are we stuck on this idea that on this day of ascension, when Jesus disappears from from our sight, from their sight, that he's gone forever until the second coming? When in fact we have time after time after time When Jesus shows his presence over and over again in different ways, in different settings, to different people, with different understandings. And we think that stops? We think God's power stops on Ascension Sunday and then a separate power comes with the Holy Spirit? Or is it like we we say we believe, (laughs) a Trinitarian faith that says God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit are one in three? Let me ask you again, because most of us sit and say, well, if Jesus did reappear after that ascension, I haven't seen him, I haven't heard from him, or as Will Williman is wont to say in the, in the disciple Bible study lesson, he had a good friend ask him if Jesus was the redeemer, why isn't the world looking a whole lot more redeemed? Where is the place you go? To allow God to have the floor. Where is the place you go? Where is the space you give? Where is the time that you build in where where the screens are shut off or put away or in another room? Where there's no communication going on that requires your brain to focus on anything but what's going on maybe in the depths of your soul. But we don't want to do that, do we? Because it's scary to think about engaging our soul at a, at a level where Jesus, in fact, might live in the image of God within us. We want, like the disciples, to stand looking up at the sky because that convinces us that Jesus is just out there somewhere and not dealing with what's going on in our hearts. <laughs> But friends, that's exactly where God is in the power of the resurrected Christ. Jesus says to us in John, where I'm going, I'm going so that you will come also. And you know the place to where I am going. And Thomas says, how do we know the way? And Jesus says, you know me. (laughs) I am that way. I am that truth. I am that life. That doesn't disappear. That doesn't go away. 
We aren't left abandoned. The world does not look the way we want it to look. I'll agree with you. I, I have a cousin who died at 47. That wasn't fair. Her parents are still alive. Don't try to convince them that's fair. I helped the Bowermans celebrate Margaret last, last week, and she was in her early 90s. So that makes it fair that she died. Don't try to convince those four boys that it's okay. Not right now. It, we're never ready to lose someone that we love, whether they're in their teens, their midlife 40s and 50s, their later life 80s and 90s. We are never ready, but friends, death is a part of our reality. I don't know why. That's God's knowledge. That's God's awareness. The question is, in the midst of the struggle of life and death and life after death, how do we allow the power of God in our lives to sustain us during the struggle? To help us survive the darkness of grief and depression and feelings of isolation and loneliness? And is it not possible as Parker Palmer said at the very beginning of this sermon series on the brink of everything, that sometimes when our hearts break, they don't break into pieces. Sometimes when our, heart break, our hearts break and, and we allow it, God will help our hearts to break open. It still doesn't feel good, but in, it increases our sensitivity. It increases our compassion. It increases our willingness to realize that we're not alone in this struggle. And that as Jesus says, you are to be my witnesses, that sometimes what it takes to be a witness is a willing to live with that grief and trust God even when we don't feel like God is anywhere around. It's a willingness sometimes to engage our soul at the deepest level and to confess those things we don't want anybody ever to know but to give them to God and to realize that, that God loves us so much that God promised that not even death would separate us from God's great love for us, love for us. Nothing, not even death would separate us from God's great love for us in Jesus Christ. It's not a matter of where Jesus goes because Jesus is right here and right here. And that's what practicing our faith is about. And sometimes we need to give God the floor. Not our social media. Not our screens. Not our tasks. Not our lists. Not our anger at, at, at one another for wearing masks or not wearing masks. Sometimes we need to give God the floor so that God has an opportunity to talk with us in the deep places that maybe we feel like we come to an awareness on a particular day at a particular time and we wonder how that happened. Maybe it happened when we gave God the floor a few days earlier. <laughs> And God was able to open our ears and our eyes and our hearts to the message God wants to give us through another person, through a webinar, or a TED Talk, or a neighbor. God's trying to get messages to us, I believe, in every single kind of way that God can. But with me, be willing to give God the floor So here's my challenge. Sometimes I experience closeness with God when I am in the mountains as high up as I can possibly get. And sometimes I experience God at the seashore when I'm wading along the water crashing in. And I look out at the vastness of the ocean and, 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 and try to imagine how somebody can't believe in God when they see that. Sometimes I experience God in the Flint Hills 
and the waves of green that go on and on and on. Sometimes, believe it or not, I experience God right here in this sanctuary. Both when it's filled with people shoulder to shoulder on Christmas Eve and Easter. And yes, even when it's a random Wednesday night and we're recording worship and there's a handful of people in here who've seen each other for the last year and a half every Wednesday night. And I still get goosebumps because I know the holiness of God is here. Where do you experience the holiness of God? Give God a chance to not just disappear from your life when things from your perspective aren't going the way you want, but to appear in your life just as mysteriously to hold you to strengthen you and to give you the grace that is the gift of the promise of eternity. Amen.